Amen. Well, let's look to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the greatness and the honor that the Father has bestowed upon you. You are exalted in the Lord of all. We submit ourselves freely to you. It's our delight and our joy. We pray that you would visit us here today, increase our faith, just establish your word, that it be a testimony of righteousness. Give us the grace that is needed for the days yet ahead, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One question before you start. Yes. <clears throat> Zion is on Mount Zion, which is south of the temple, correct? It's or on the Temple Mount. It's on the Temple Mount, and it's the southwestern corner. Okay. Where was the tabernacle of David, the tent pitched on that? We don't know. I always thought that was Zion, the way some of it referred. You know, I yes. mean, the same place. It's the same place, but... It's been destroyed so many times that we don't know. We know where Zion, we know where some of it is. Because Zion was probably quite large. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what is known is where, we don't even know if it's where the center was. We just know that, that those walls and I think they found some chambers is a configuration of Zion. But how large Zion was and did it encompass the entire Temple Mount, I don't think anyone knows and, and I don't know if uh, that is suggested. So, um, so ask your question again. Oh, about the Tabernacle of David when he pitched the tent. So we don't know. We don't know what room he put it in. But the Tabernacle of David isn't Zion, it's a part of Zion. It was a tent, when he pitched the tent, and right. when they brought the ark back. Right, and he took it to Zion. Yes. That's so he brought it in his house somewhere. He put it in a hallway or on the second floor. Well, we, don't, I, we don't know where he well, put so it. It was a tent on top of a hill so everyone could see. That I don't know. I don't know that. I mean, it may be that, this, that scholars have figured that out. Oh, I thought that's what the Bible said. It was a hill. Well, he pitched a tent for a, a tent, made a tabernacle of a tent for the uh, to house the ark. Yes, but whether it was visibly on display, I don't know. We don't know where he put it, oh, other okay. than Zion. Could have put it in the basement. I don't know. I don't think the Bible has a mm -hmm. has a suggestion. been built on the ruins just kept being built on so many times <clears throat> well Zion and the, and the tabernacle of David are two different things just like your home and your couch are two different things was the tabernacle of David just a temporary outing when it was first brought mm -hmm. but he took it he took it to Zion well he took it to Zion until, until mm -hmm. Solomon built the temple then the ark was put in the most holy place. And so in a sense, the tabernacle of David was uh, um, disengaged. It was demoted. It was... Replaced. Well, the, he had a tent and an ark, and the ark got taken out and put in Solomon's temple, so it was just a tent left over. So it's... it's yeah, I just wondered where it was. We don't even know. Tent. We don't even know what it Zion looked like. About a hill or something in, in scripture, it talks about a hill that it was set on that everybody could see because it glowed. You know, because of the ark in it, it glowed. Okay, so can I give you a homework assignment to find that? Okay. I, I don't remember ever okay. reading that it glowed or that everyone could see it. Okay. In fact, there's a hint. See, in the Holy of Holies, nobody sees what's going on. See, and that the Holy of Holies is a human heart. See, this is your, this is the temple of God, and that's going. And so, the t even though the Tabernacle of David was deconstructed, it's going to be rebuilt. See, and that that the, those are days yet ahead of us, and so many people create an estimate: what should that look like, or could, what could that look like? But uh, yeah, so if you look that up. Um, but Zion is a large place, and the, the Ark of the Covenant's 
what, six feet wide? So we don't know where in Zion it was stored. Okay, so I'm going to relaunch a program here. Take a. What I wanted to do while we're waiting for that is describe to you uh, the high holy days in which we are in now. Uh, Rosh Hashanah began uh, the evening of Wednesday a week ago. And Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year. That's what it means. Rosh is head which also, you know, like, <coughs> like the head of a river, it's the beginning, and Shana is the word for year. And it's the month of Tishri, which in the religious year is the seventh month. So Israel has two calendars side by side. One calendar begins in the first month, the next calendar begins in the seventh month. And we have the same thing in our economy. We have a calendar year and we also have a school year. We have a fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And so Israel is constructed the, the same way. So even though <laughs> it's New Year's, it's still the seventh month of, um, of the year that begins uh, before Passover. The three numbers to remember, if you're up for it, is the 1st, the 10th, and the 15th. Those are the dates of the three main feasts, the three fall feasts. So the 1st of Tishri is Rosh Hashanah, the 10th of Tishri is Yom Kippur, and the 15th of Tishri is um, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And on God's calendar, the first of the month, it's based on the moon. So the first of the month is always a new moon. And a new moon occurs when the moon is on the other side of the sun. And we can't see it. It's, if you watch the moon, it, it can be a sliver, then it becomes full, and then it goes back to a sliver again. And so when it's on the other side, when it's on the, the sun side of the earth, then the, the light of the sun is on its backside, and we can't see it. It's dark because it's not. It, actually, there's something called earth shine. Yeah. The, the sun shines on the earth, and it reflects on the surface of the moon. So that's why, um, well, at any rate. Um, so then as the moon goes around, and it's on, now the earth is in between the sun and the moon. That's a full moon then we're looking at the moon being exposed to light by the sun, which is on the other side, which is now fully lit. So that's a full moon. And during a full moon, you, you often have an eclipse of the moon. During a new moon, you often have an eclipse of the sun. You can never have an eclipse of the moon on the first of the month, and you can never have an eclipse of the sun on the 15th of the month. So just, just the science of it just can't work. So sometimes scholars will say, and this is naturalism, which is one of the enemies of the of uh, modern, uh, you know, modern Christianity. They'll say when the sun was darkened, when Jesus was crucified, that was an eclipse of the sun. No, because Passover is on the 15th. And if there's an eclipse, it's got to be the eclipse of the moon. So, you know, it's like, do some homework at least. <laughs> But it, that's what unbelief does. It makes you create something false in order to minimize the Bible. And so, so now if you look at the moon, has anybody looked? Do you watch the moon at all? So it's a third quarter, which means very shor shortly it's going to be a full moon. When it's a full moon, then that will be Sukkot. And so, so that's the 8th of October. It's coming up, and that's a blood moon. Would that also be that be Sukkot? I thought she said first tip at 15th. I wrote it down. Well, that's of Tishri. She's oh. using the you know, the modern calendar. So Sukkot begins uh, what sundown Tuesday. I'd, I'd have to look it up. Yeah. 
and there will be an eclipse of the moon this year. So part of the problem with the tetrad and the blood moons, and it's like that's the time of year that you have a, an eclipse. Eclipses occur about the 15th of the lunar month, and so that's when you have Passover, and that's when you have Tabernacle. So the probability of an eclipse is high, and so to ascribe a special work of God to it when it happens naturally, see, that's naturalism again. That's, we're going to explain the Bible by something that happens naturally. And it's, I think, when, I think when the sun is darkened and the moon turns to blood and the stars of heaven fall, yeah. see, they don't, they don't add that. <laughs> In fact, I heard one preacher say they had meteorites during one of these, and he said, and USA Today said that those were falling stars. So who am I to resist USA Today? It's like, mm -hmm. that's your authority? <laughs> you know? No, when the stars fall, the stars fall. It, I mean, it, it's a supernatural event. But if you're given to naturalism, then you'll look for a natural way by which it's um, fulfilled. So, and naturalism is doomed to failure. Just so you know, I'm announcing it ahead of time. It's doomed to failure. It says stars that have no fall to earth. One star, if it even came millions or whatever miles from here, earth couldn't stand it. Well, I think so, maybe this, uh, if anything falls to the earth, it's angelic, it's a, right. it's a symbol. But when Jesus is talking about the sun, moon, and the stars, he doesn't say they fall to the earth, they just fall. Yeah. They just fall, okay. So, in Judaism, Rosh Hashanah is a fresh start, it's a new year. And, you, and of course, you know Yom Kippur, that's when their sins are atoned for once a year. So they've maintained that economy. But more specifically, what's been developed over uh, the centuries since the resurrection is the idea of attaching the Book of Life to this period of time. And so their belief is that on Rosh Hashanah, God writes down what your life is going to be like for the next year. The good, bad, and the ugly. But you can change it by repenting and confessing your sins. And if you do, if you do that before Yom Kippur, 10 days later, then you'll have a good year. But if you don't repent, it's whatever God decides for you, that's, that's your lot. And so that's why they call these high holy days, because they see the relationship between how they behave and how God treats them. So they take this time of year quite seriously. And, uh, and the devout do repent, and they do remember their sins from the year, and they do make a conscious um, and deliberate assent to the Lord and his righteousness and his requirements. They say yes to, to his will. This is a little more unique in that their belief is that God decides for this coming year who dies, who's born, how and how you die, how you live, are you gonna be exalted, are you gonna be low? It's, um, it's, it's written, it's inscribed on Rosh, on, uh, Rosh Hashanah. And then if you repent, then it's changed and the, the harshness is removed. So but that if principle is in the scripture, like when he was going to destroy the city. Yes, yeah, like Nineveh. Like yeah. Noah went right. and preached Jeremiah. to them. They preached and they... They prayed and he repented. God yes. repented and yes. he didn't destroy them. So yes. that notion is there. Yes, it's a Bible notion. It's an Old Testament notion. It's like the books are open during this time. Yes. And you've got a certain amount of time to get your life straight. To get it straight. And then the books are closed. Right. And then... And it's, forget it. It's sealed. Right. Then, then you have the adventure of the, of the new year. You know, that's when you find out how you did. Yes. Whatever holds, right? right. Have you described what Jerusalem was like on that day? I didn't. Um, on, on Yom Kippur, the city is totally at rest. There are no taxis, no traffic. Everything is closed, and there's this hush mm -hmm. that comes upon the city. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's holy, uh, is my judgment. And uh, the only traffic are ambulances. 
uh, because you were allowed to res rescue the sick uh, even on Yom Kippur. In fact, I had an encounter. Uh, it was Yom Kippur. We were, uh, it was the morning of Yom Kippur. I woke up and looked out on the main thoroughfare, and it turned out, uh, well, I'll tell you the story, then I'll tell you what happened. There were men um, tinkering with a car that was in the middle of the road. So for a car to be there on Yom Kippur is unusual. Mm -hmm. So I watched them, and they very carefully went into the engine compartment disconnected the gas line. One guy cranked the engine, which won't start now because there's no gas, but it did pump the gasoline onto the car. Uh, they took out a guitar and then they lit the car on fire and they fled. And it turns out they were terrorists and the car was stolen. And so I, I didn't discover that until later. Uh, and the way we found out those details, there was you know, we were there as volunteer, Christian volunteers, and there was one of us on the street in our property right there, to, if, and she, uh, she took pictures. And so when the police came and uh, uh, you know, she, she went out and uh, she said, uh, I, I, I watched those men. And, and she, when she narrated the dialogue, it was just very precious how the police said, you took pictures, you have them here, you have them now, you know, <laughs> can we see them? You yeah. know? So uh, yeah, it turned out it was too dark and she didn't adjust her camera for the light, so there was really nothing there. But in any case, um, I see the fire in the street, so I go out into the, to, to a street that kind of forms a V. So I'm on this street, not the street where the fire was. And the high priest of Yom Kippur, all dressed up, is walking from his home, because we, we, uh, our, our youth hostel was in an Orthodox neighborhood. And he was, it was early in the morning, so he's on his way to set up the, you know, the, the synagogue for Yom Kippur, and I see him, and I want to call the fire department. I don't know how. And so I go running up, and so here's this goy, you know, just waking up, probably hair is all over. I think I probably had a t-shirt on. Uh, and I knew enough Hebrew to say, esh, esh, fire, fire. And he said, F-O, where? And I pointed at Bever Hove in the street. And then he asked, I could tell he was asking, is anyone harmed? Because that's, he will violate mm -hmm. Yom Kippur if someone is in danger. And then I said, no. And so he's off the hook. You know? So I said, where is a telephone? And he pointed to a, a telephone. But back in those days, you had to have special coins. And I just got up out of bed here, pulled my yeah. <laughs> And we had the little tokens, but I didn't. So I asked him, do you have any telephone to tokens? <laughs> and he shrugged and said no. And by then I heard the fire engine, so everything was okay. <laughs> so that's my Yom Kippur story. For, uh, but yes, it's, but it's a very holy time, and everyone respects it. And uh, it's very quiet. And it would be remarkable to see something like that here in the United States, where we just take a day and settle. Uh, honey and apples come from? That's Rosh Hashanah. I mean, I know, but... Well, it's the sweet, it's the beginning, it's, this is a, it's a sweet time of year. I can understand it's with the a, honey, but the apples? It's a sweet fruit. There's a lot of sweet fruit. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm just, <laughs> I just, I didn't know if it was more to it than that. that yeah, just, I don't think they so. They just picked an apple and that, okay. No, it's, uh... And I may have other video which 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 highlights the the use of fruit and the sweetness. Yeah, it's a it's a severe time of year. At the same time, it's very sweet. It's it's a mixture, uh, just like life. You know, the the severe and the good. And um, I should have brought up a verse. I just referred to it, but I, let's just take a minute and read it. Um, 
because last week we looked at Isaiah 28, 16, where it talks about a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious stone. And I referred to um, uh, something that Jesus said in Matthew 21. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring that up. Twenty one starting to forty two down to yeah, forty four. And Jesus said unto them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. Whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall will grind him to powder. And so we don't have much choice. You, you, you can have vanilla, you can have chocolate. <laughs> it's, it's up to you. You, know, you can choose uh, your experience with the Lord. It's, um, and then we are down as far as Isaiah 29.8, so we'll go down there. And it shall be as when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he eats, but he awakes, and his soul is empty. Or when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he drinks, but he awakes, and behold, he is faint, and his, whole, and his soul has appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Zion. And so the, the drama here is... Um, A, a dream is really real to you, and then when you wake up, then reality is more real. So if you're thirsty and you're dreaming, you're drinking, when you wake up, you didn't drink. It was just a dream. And so what God is saying is, you know, like the terrorists, they have a dream. They fight against Zion. And that dream is really real to them, but it's a, it's a dream. It's just a dream. It's not real. And someday they'll wake up, and the dream will be gone, and they'll see what is really there. And so fighting against Zion puts you in a, <laughs> in a dilemma where your imagination uh, makes you believe that it's really happening, and it's not. And so uh, make sure you're not fighting against Zion, because it's just it's whoever fights against Zion. So when you... When, you, when the Lord presents to you the requirements of Zion and the, the majesty of Zion, um, the flesh will say, thanks, but no thanks. And so you have to watch that. The enemy will try to sneak in and say, you know, it's a bunch of nothing. You know, they're all loony. You know, don't pay any attention. Well, then you introduce yourself to this dilemma of misunderstanding. That's what happens. You misunderstand. You think something's true, and it really is not. You think something's not true, and it really is. And so it's a delusion. And one of the perils of the last day, according to the scriptures, the New Testament, is that God will send a strong delusion so that people will believe a lie. And so be careful about winds of doctrine and things that come and go. And that's why I speak a little forwardly about the tetrad, because that's, that's promoted by the church. That's promoted by well-meaning, sincere Christians, that this is going to happen. And, and when you're listening to it, it grips you. It's like, oh my goodness. Uh, but when you go away, it's not there anymore. And so uh, it's, it's just like Y2K. Do you remember <laughs> the, the uproar then? Yeah. And so it's the same thing. And nothing happened. Right. And uh, That's right. Uh, there was a, we had a Bible study at work and one of the Christian brothers there was really for it. And I remember him pounding on the table and he said, people will die <laughs> on Y2K. Uh, no one died. So, so be careful of that. And the Harbinger actually is another one that's taken grip. And maybe if the Lord leads, I'll review it with you. Just It's faulty. It's filled with great fault. But because it's designed so cleverly, and it's the enemy that does the design, I don't think the brother that puts it forward is knowingly doing it, but, he's, but he thinks something is true that isn't true, and so it'll come and go. Be careful of happen chance. That's what 
gets these things started where you have an oddity in history and it comes again and so you so you ascribe significance to that um, and that's superstitious superstition is when you believe that something causes something else when there's no cause and effect relationship you know you walk under a ladder and you have bad luck that's superstition there is no cause and effect there where, where's the cause and effect but if you believe it, it's pretty strong. Yeah, you can uh, even get fear. Yes, well, you, you do get fear. Yeah, and it makes you walk around the ladder. Or, or do you ever see anybody out try to outrace a cat? You know, if a black cat walks across you, the idea is get in front of it so it doesn't cross, <laughs> doesn't cross your path. You know, it's superstition. And so if you believe that... that a senator years ago uttered a prayer after 9-11 and the scripture he used is another scripture that relates to Wall Street which astonishingly was where George Washington was inaugurated. When you're from back east none of that surprises you. I mean it's, it's like, like I think it can only win out here that kind of argument because back east I went to school every day on the street that George Washington marched on his way to Valley Forge. Every day. It's, it's common. I, and I just discovered uh, uh, there's a creek nearby that I frequented as a boy. And, and um, one of the famous pietists from Germany lived there, I mean, he, which is a, uh, uh, something I've been studying very deeply. History surrounds you. Wherever you go, there's history. And so to be amazed that there's a church not far from, a, from the 9-11 site on Manhattan where George Washington was inaugurated, it's like, well, and, and why is that astonishing? Uh, but if you don't know, if you don't know that it's merely an event in history that happens to coincide, it happens, it's coincidental. And it's superstitious to believe that it has significance and it, it, it grips you. Once, once you kind of get over that barrier, it grips you. So what I did, I listened, because it's on YouTube, I listened to Tom Daschle's The Senator's Prayer and, and the, the modern version of it, misquote him. It is not what he said, it is not what he meant. And so it starts to fall apart. But it's very exciting to have all of these patterns tied together but you have to believe that it's important that it happened. And if you do, okay. But we'll see. We'll see. I mean, that's my vote. I don't think anything's going to happen, but we'll see. Um, one place I saw that dramatically was uh, the year that Kennedy was assassinated. Researchers found a great number of parallels between the presidency of President Lincoln and President Kennedy, you know, the same number of letters, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Kennedy's Secretary of State was Lincoln and Lincoln's Secretary of State was Kennedy or something, you know, that kind of thing, and they just built a case. Well, it got us all excited, but it came and went. It, 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 it wasn't significant. It was there, but it was an oddity. It didn't, didn't produce anything, so, so be careful about that. So, uh, and your safety from that kind of thing is Zion. And then you won't dream one thing and find out that reality is something else. You, 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 will, you will measure life accurately. That, that's a gift to the body of Christ, of seeing what is really there and not being in anguish about it. See, when, uh, when the believers start you know, storing up water and you know, the drill, buying gold, that's the... That's the thing that convinced me about Y2K. Scientifically, I knew Y2K was bogus. And religious, spiritually, it was not biblical. It just didn't fit. But they hosted a conference down here in San Diego on Y2K. And all of this was Christianese, by the way. It was put forward by the Christians. So I went down there to, to, to this symposium, and it was in a large auditorium. And around the auditorium were vendors, which I didn't expect. And guess what they were selling? Beans. Gold and silver. Uh. See, that's your salvation. You know, if you if you want a if you want a good way out of Y2K, then buy some gold, and buy some silver. And it, that that litany is still here today. And but so, it, Y2K 
is based on the Gregorian calendar, not the Jewish calendar. <clears throat> well, but, but even I, at that. I don't pay any heed to what people say about it. Yeah, so it's, there's a long list of reasons why it was yeah. bogus. You know. Well, it's just like they're telling you to buy gold and silver today, but it says, it, you know, what difference does it make? Because you're not to take the mark. So you're not going to be able to buy or sell anyway if you don't take the mark. Right? Yeah, so it's, uh, they're not delivering us from the mark. They're, they're trying to keep us safe. <clears throat> you want a hint here? <laughs> The markets go up and the markets go down. Yep. Right. And so what are you supposed to do? When do you buy? When it's down. When it's down and then what do you do when it's up? Sell. Okay, so I have gold and I go on TV and I want to sell and I want you to buy. Guess where the market is? Guess where you're buying? You're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> They've outsmarted you, and, and they want to give you reasons why, oh, this is, no, it's all safe and inflation proof and all that. You know, it's, no, it, it's up, and so they want to give it to you, because then they'll make the money and not you. <clears throat> Isn't that happy? That's what, the, that's what the love of money does, and so uh, don't be sucked into that or any other financial scheme. Be careful with Christian financial schemes. I've seen them all come and go. Not one of them has survived. It used to be oil wells in Israel. Do you remember that one? <clears throat> yeah, buy an oil well in Israel. And I said to the man who was lobbying for it, who wouldn't believe that I was giving him good advice, and I said, well, let's, because he, 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 he went out and already he invested ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 into this oil. <clears throat> it all came from the scripture about oil being on the toe of Asher and they know where Asher is and it comes down to a point and that's the toe and so that's where they're drilling. See? So he gave him $20,000. So I said to him, okay, uh, when, in your judgment now, that how real this is, how much time that if it goes by will you decide that it was a fraud? How much time if, in other words, will it produce oil in the next month, the next year, the next 10 years, how much time will you need before you realize that you were conned? And he said a year. No, this is gonna, this is gonna come in in a year. And so the year comes and goes. And then I reminded him, of course it made him angry. <laughs> <laughs> Told you so. Yeah, it's like you, you had good advice back then, but it grips you. See, it's the dream, you know, and it sings. It, and it's because we have a song inside, and dreamland, boy, anything can happen, you know. It's, uh, so be careful of that. <clears throat> Isaiah thirty nineteen. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry. And he shall hear it and he shall answer. And that's another key attribute of Zion. But you have to live there. These are they who live in Zion. They dwell in Zion. And so part of the Christian life is a journey. I think the portrayal of the scripture is that when you first accept the Lord, it's like you're birthed in Zion. You, you're already you know, the child of the king, so to speak. And uh, like Abraham and <coughs> others, it gets spent. We, we walk away from it. Uh, we, we relish it, uh, but we don't value it. And so then the Christian life, I think you can almost time how long it takes for a Christian to start to be jaded and starts pursuing the world again. And the, uh, the Ephesian church, Remember, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The book of Ephesians has not one rebuke in it. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus talks. And this is, you know, the uh, book of Revelation has got to be uh, 30, 40 years later. Uh, and he says to the church at Ephesus, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. Repent from where you have fallen and do the first works. Get back to where you were. And so that's a picture of Zion because, see, the Jews were taken out of Zion to Babylon and then they were restored. And that happens in the Christian life too. We are given things, but we don't value it and we spoil it. We, 
uh, we turn the Christian life into, you know, what, you know, what about me and um, what we want, and and the flesh robs us of our inheritance only to be, it's the prodigal son. You, you, you walk away from the inheritance only to be restored. And so Zion has those two sides to it. That's why we see, and we'll see in the verses just yet ahead, uh, the idea that Zion got spoiled for you. On the other hand, Zion is a grand place. But the idea of being a remnant and being restored is an important one so that you can use the scriptures to judge your Christian life and see, have you traveled back yet? Are you, did you get to the summit? And, uh, and the answer is probably not yet. And I, how can I tell? Because you're breathing. Because I think, I think when the Lord is finished, he, he says, now you're, now you're ready. Uh, come on board. I've got, I've got more for you. Yes. And I understand Zion is a grand place, and it's a great summit, and we're born there, and life's a journey. But I think I get lost when I think I'm going toward the great city. I, I don't know how to put this. Let's see. How can I journey there when it's, how can I go there when it's in me? Well, because the spiritual world is not an idea. The spiritual world isn't merely in us. What's in us is part of, an, of, an, of a world. And so it, it's not a perfect match between what's happening in the spirit and what's happening in your heart. What's happening in your heart is a component of the whole, but it doesn't dictate the whole. And so... Let me see if I can ask the question another way. Why is it that we feel we are not there when we feel we already have it? Is that a better way? Or in, yeah. where, so the tension is that the scriptures say we have it, but on the other hand, we don't experience it. Is it deep calling unto deep? Well, I'm trying to measure the, the, the misconnect. Yeah. Is it, so start with what's in us and then add to that what causes the, you know, how can this be? Or ask your question again. Well, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's just breaking it down to there's a part of the whole. There, there is that journeying to that place of fullness. I think of that book, Journey into Fullness. And then, so I'm drawing there, but at the same time, it's in me. That's developing as I go closer. Is that a good way to put it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, need, I now see what you mean, deep calls the deep. Yes. That's, it is what it is. That kind of like knowing the identity. We, we read about the identity of who you're supposed to be in the Bible, but actually receiving it and then understanding is kind of like a parallel to it. Yes. Is it the internal Christ in you, the whole glory, and yet there's the external Christ that we're seeking communion with? Yes, it's, uh, let, let me verbalize it slightly differently. The Holy Spirit in the scripture is called an earnest. We have the earnest of the spirit. And that's a modern term, and it means down payment. When you give money in earnest, it's, 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 you're, you've, you've made a down payment. And the purpose of a down payment is the idea, I want to buy something and I want to show you I'm serious. So do I give a little down payment or I give a big one? To show that I'm serious. The big one. The, yeah, the bigger the better, okay. But I do it in prospect of a future transaction. So the Holy Spirit is that earnest. It's God's down payment. I'm serious about this. And I'm going to give you a generous portion of myself, but it's not the whole thing. I haven't bought you yet. Mm. The redemption is yet to come. Right. And this is the beginning of a process. It's a, it's a pledge. I mean this. And so 
So that is one thing, but the other thing of finding the path toward that completion is the purpose of the Christian life. Right. There's no other purpose to the Christian life except to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith, to, to grow in the Lord and to be fashioned into his image. It's, it's not done with the deposit. The deposit gets it started, and it's a generous deposit. But don't equate the grandness of what he has given you with the grandness of what is coming. If you can see the grandness, so how much do you put down on a house? If you're going to be generous. 20%. 20, yeah, 20%, I mean, that's huge. <laughs> Usually it's 10% or you're, you're going to even be less. They have 0%, you know, I'm not really serious. I want the house, but you know, I'm not going to commit. Because if, if you renege on the deal, you lose that. Okay, so, so God is saying, I'm not going to renege on this. So he has given a generous portion of, his, of himself to us, but it's only a part. Jesus needs to be more fully developed in you. And that's what Paul said to the Galatians. My little children of whom I travail in faith until Christ be formed in you. So we have the down payment, but he has to be formed. It's a, it's a process. Because there are issues that, you, that the Lord has to take you through. We don't realize at that time that there's still a hostile part of our personality toward the Lord. And, and he's gentle, and he, but he will systematically bring them to your attention, as I said the other week, usually through failure, where you recognize this, this is really important to me, so you sow to it, and you give it all you got, and it ends in ruin. And then the Lord says, can you see there's a part of you that values something that produces shame? Let it go. Let it go. Let me be your portion. And so you learn to release it. You learn to renounce it. And so the human being is so complex, we don't know all of the issues that are in us. And the Lord doesn't blather them to us. He doesn't say, well, let me read you the riot act. You know, here's my list. You know. What he does, he brings up something. He says, let's work on this. But you won't cooperate with him unless you see the value of it. And it produces a genuine, you become crestfallen. You're ashamed. You're, Lord, I, that's me. I mean, I can't believe that I value this dust this, you know, this this vanity and so uh, the Lord says well will, will you give it and let me replace it with what I value see and part of the gospel is the value in the gospel is unappreciated by the world see, in the gospel up is down down is up great is little and little is great and it's it, you, you almost are faced with a dilemma of the life that is around you is opposite of the life that's in the kingdom. And so little by little you learn to abandon that which destroys and accept what gives you life. And it's a process and it takes a lifetime. It's, 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 God's not in a rush. He wants you done properly. <laughs> you We're know, not fast food. You know, he's, he's, That's an interesting discussion when you're talking about redemption because we are redeemed, but you don't get the full redemption until you get there. You're totally yeah. bought with the prophet. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, and that, again, that purchase is, is the beginning of a process. The Bible, when it talks about being saved, uses three tenses. One is that we have been saved. The second tense, it uses that we are being saved. And it uses a future tense, we shall be saved. So in a sense, you're not saved yet. You've begun it, you're, on, you're well on your way, but there is more yet to come. And so the purpose of the Christian life is to cause it to come to completeness. One of the difficulties, and the scholars give this, and this is hard to take, I know, the scholars give it a name, it's called textualism. And textualism occurs when you grab a verse and you say, this is mine, it's talking about me, therefore it must be so. You can't do that with the Bible. Things in the Bible are only true if it's true for you. It, it, has, it has to be true for you. That's what makes it true, not because it says. But we confuse. We, con we confuse the printed text 
as a mechanism of understanding of what's true about us. And you can't do that. Uh, the famous joke among the evangelicals, uh, it says, so I'm going to use some Bible. Okay, you ready for this? I'm going to take two verses and put them together. Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do thou likewise. So that's an extreme case, isn't it? <laughs> but, but both are Bible. And so you can take things and create anything you want. That's one of the reasons why there's so, so much arguing and differences in the, in the body of Christ is because it becomes a handy skill. I'll pull a verse here, a verse there, and I'll create something, and then, then you're stuck. Yeah. But let me give you the real reason why you can't just take the Bible just because it says and say it must be true of me, because the Holy Spirit calls those things were that are not as though they are. So you have to test it. So if you're accepted in the beloved, you've got to go to the Lord and say, how am I doing? I want this to be true. Is there anything that's hindering it? Because it, once you say that everything is okay, then you won't pay attention to your sins. You'll discount your sins because, I mean, why, why, why attend to them if you're okay? I mean, if there is no book and there is no inscribing and there is no repentance required, uh, then you'll, meet, you'll lead the merry life only to find at the judgment seat that you were dreaming. And I don't want yeah. that. <laughs> I'm willing to dig and dig and dig and change <laughs> whatever it takes. But I don't want to be in a la-la land where I think I'm okay and I'm not. Amen. I don't want that. It's like I've given the Lord permission, <clears throat> manhandle me if necessary. You know, hit me upside the head, you know, like a, you know, duh, you know, help me to get it. Because if you don't teach it to me, I will get it. I mean, who, I, I remember my frame, I'm but dust. And so, so, so hold on to things gently. And if you see a verse and you and it just burns inside you, say, Lord, make this true of me. Make this true of me. And then he'll walk you through that path. Well, there's a scripture that says, uh, oh, the Lord will light my candle. He will enlighten my darkness. We, we don't realize we're in darkness. And unless he lights it, like you say, yeah. we, we have no sight. And, and I know we call out and we say, Lord, in your mercy, don't leave me where I am. Yeah. Because we know where we yeah. are is not the place. Right. And the traditional yeah. church has fed sugar. For yes. Meal. Yes. Yeah. You know, you're you're so sweet. You're so well. God loves mm -hmm. you so, much, mm -hmm. and just have forgotten about, you know. <clears throat> and that's not bad if you're if you're coddling an infant. I mean, how wonderful is a baby? I mean, you just ah. I mean, they could do no wrong. <laughs> but when you start growing, then all of a sudden the uh, the tests change. You know, you get. You have to learn to mow the lawn. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> life changes. Here's one of my favorites. Paul said, when I was a child, I did the things of a child. But when I came a man, here, here's, the, here's the hook. When I became a man, I put away childish things. That means some things you do early in your Christian life needs to be put away. It served them, but it will not. Even though it's Bible, it served you then, but it's no longer current. It's not what you currently need to hear. And so then verses like, you know, you know, lift up the hands that hang down and feel, and you'll know, play the man, you know, <laughs> like God talked to Job, you know, if, uh, if, if all God says are sweet things, then we don't need Job as an example. You know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Come on, tell me, come on, speak up, you know, <laughs> who gave the ostrich cunning and the eagles, that we, you know, <laughs> who said Orion in the, in the stars, you know. And you, you, you find it. And here's what Job says. I've heard of you with the hearing of my ear, my ear, but now I see you. And so we need to teach that that's a transformation that occurs in the Christian life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there's, there's one thing to hear about it and have it all memorized. And it's another thing to see it for yourself. And so that's the important thing. And another progression, because you're saying progression here, you know, which is, we're not taught that. We're just saying, oh, well, we've arrived. Yeah. But mm -hmm. another progression is that you get old enough to enter into the army. Yes, yes, yeah. What's waiting for you is a, is a draft card. Mm 
<laughs> and well, you, you don't like that. Don't let the commander chief. Right. Say, oh, what's this? I don't know about that. Yeah, what's this? What's this fighting? I thought I was safe. You know, no, they're, they're enemies. Zion's a fortress. You know, it, there's war uh, around, but God doesn't introduce you to war early. Remember, the young man gets married. You don't send him to war. You know, go home and you know, enjoy your family and start a family, and then, then when it's established, then I'll take you to war. So, God sent Israel south when they came out of Egypt. Because he didn't want them to see war. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Because it'll, it'll mystify them. So you go south, you go to Sinai, you spend years there in the wilderness until you learn how to fight. And then he says, you've compassed this mountain, and that mountain is actually Pentecost. You've compassed the mountain of Pentecost long enough. Turn northward. And that's when the war begins. And that's when the birthing begins. There's a new, what's a new year for the Jewish people is a new life. A new, there's a new economy coming to the Christian life. One that's in the Bible, but one we haven't experienced. And it's unlike what we've had so far. And so then you learn that Jesus really is the author and finisher of your faith. See, we portray him as author of our faith. But he also finishes. He's, he's, it's a work that needs to be done, and it's an ongoing work. I have a fa favorite story, it's a true story, of a pastor who went through this transformation of realizing, whoops, maybe I'm not so red hot. <laughs> and he told us, I mean, he, he, I mean he admitted, what happened was he had a little plot of grass out in front of his house. And he was very zealous over that grass. And so he planted new seed and, you know, put up a little, you know, how they put up the string and took care of it day by day, watered it in exact proportion. And one day when he was in the house and he heard a ruckus out in the front and he came out and there was a dog <laughs> digging through his lawn. And he swore at the dog. You blankety blankety blank, four letter words, big juicy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's when he realized, Lord, that, that's in me. Mm -hmm. This is so important, I defied <laughs> you. <laughs> you know? And he says, I guess I'm not done. Mm -hmm. you know, because you, if you have successful ministry, you kind of figure, you know, what, what else is there? <laughs> Only to discover. So God sends the little dogs yeah, yeah, to tear apart your, your <laughs> precious your precious little plot. And go for it. Go for But you know, Paul, that's what, what you're bringing up is so good because the Jews have what is it, the 40 days and the 10 days of awe where they get before the Lord and they ask the Lord, what's inside of me that I need to repent of? Yes. And that's a good thing. We need to yes, be doing is. that with ourselves. Yes, we do. What's inside of us? Show us, Lord, because there are things that we do in our own personalities, we don't even know we do it. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes. True. Yes. You know? And he starts horrible. bringing that up, yeah. and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even see that. Yeah. Yeah. You need to yeah. Yeah. Amen. yeah, and it's worth doing. Well, let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the grandness of your word, and we want to live this life that yes. you've given us, Lord. We yes, want to Lord. see it to its yes. end. We want to experience the fullness. Bless the service to come, we pray in Jesus' name.